All right. So looks like we're live. So uh, everybody, hope everyone's doing well. I'm live here with a good friend of mine, Sarah Anderson. She is at the Vault Fund. Um, she is actively um, investing in a lot of different, um, you know, technologies, you know, specifically fund managers that are on the uh, the venture studio side. So we're going to talk about Sarah, learn about her career. Uh, some of the people in the community are looking to break into VC, looking to launch their own fund, also be emerging LPs. So, you know, as you're being an LP, you know, some of the some of the programming and, um, you know, content, you know, and thought leadership that Sarah has helped me put together is really just around how to be an LP. So if you're investing in funds, how, you know, how should you look at that? And, you know, there's different types of profiles as well. So if you're a single family office, if you're a fund to fund, if you're a pension fund, they're looking at it through all different lenses. And, you know, we could probably talk about mandates as well, you know, because you have that mandate that really drives um, your core strategy and, and why you have that strategy. So I think there's a lot of stuff to unpack. And, um, you know, I've known Sarah for, you know, a little over, I think, a year and a half now. Yeah. And uh, it's just been great. Uh, getting to know her. And, um, you know, she's also been able to connect me with some amazing people, too. So I think that's another thing, just kind of build friendships. And, and uh, you, you never knew who, who you could get connected to through the, uh, the web of the uh, connectedness of everybody. But Sarah, thanks for making time for me and catching up. I know it's been a while. So I was excited to see how you've been. Yeah, it's great to see you. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to be able to talk about what we're doing and where we've been and how we got to this point. But yeah, I mean, I would second the the power of networks is very strong in this category. Private alternative assets generally, like whether you're on the GP side or the LP side, mm -hmm. or even family offices and high net worth, like we get a lot of our deal flow and we also get a lot of our LPs from our networks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's it's something that you're constantly working on and building. Yeah. One thing I'll say is, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. And, you know, that's why I think you get alpha also just from being generous to everybody. I mean, I, I've had like random business school students introduce me to someone really amazing. So, you know, it doesn't really matter how old you are or where you are in life. You know, if you're kind to that person, you never know where that person could end up. That person could be a large institutional allocator at some point, you know, later in their career. And yeah. it's such a small world that they'll remember who you are. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's something that I've seen kind of just walking through life and seeing people evolve in their careers. But why don't we kick this off? I mean, so why don't we start with uh, you and your family and your education? You know, where did you go to school? What did you study? And, you know, how did that kind of drive your thinking in terms of getting into this career? And I know you've. Um, had a you know a couple different pivots like I have, so we'd we'll love to unpack all of that. Yeah, so I grew up on a farm in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. I had an amazing childhood. Always different animals, different experiences, just exploring. Um, mm -hmm. And I ended up going to University of Florida on a track scholarship. And I had this big notion when I was an undergrad that I wanted to change the world, which I still do but in a different yeah. way, but I was going to go work for Doctors Without Borders and the Peace mm -hmm. Corps. And after graduation, I moved up to DC and started working in the Senate. And my first salary, full-time salary was mm -hmm. $2,000 a year in DC. Sure. And it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And so I literally was working three jobs to try mm -hmm. to pay for my apartment and try to survive. And I was like, hey, this just isn't going to work. There's no way I yeah. can support myself or family. So um, I decided at that point to go back to school in a career where no matter what, I knew I was going to be able to thrive financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I went to UCLA business school, studied finance and graduated in 2008 in the middle of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. My classmates were getting recruited and then their offers were getting rescinded left and right. They would start yeah. and then they would get a pink slip two, three weeks later, like just horror stories. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I graduated. I went to RBC. RBC was Canadian bank. They were very stable at the time. I was in their investment banking group and loved it, just mm -hmm. ate it up. I mean, yeah. Excel modeling was 
like crack to me, right? I mm -hmm. just, I loved it. And um, I thrived there. And I went um, after about three or four years to JP Morgan. And first, how were the hours? I guess, tell us about the, cause that was in probably the early, I'm not sure what year it was and I don't want to uh, bring up the date, but like, I guess what, how were the hours? I guess, cause back then I, I know when I was living in New York city, um, you know, 2006, 2005, that was like the cool time to be in, in, in banking. Like nobody got burned out. It was like so cool to work like hundred hour work weeks and like yeah. work was like your life. It was part of your lifestyle. Right. So people would yeah. work. I had a roommate. I lived in Manhattan and I had a roommate. We had like a three bedroom apartment and this guy was a banker and I never saw him. Like he told me a lot of times he would just sleep in the office. So I had like this like high rise to myself. Um, but, you know, he didn't mind because he just at that age, too, I think especially that's how the energy is in New York. Like everyone's just super career oriented and you feed off of that. But like, is that kind of how the hours were with you, too, like early in your first banking analyst role? Yeah. And it and I think one of the key differences is at RBC, it was not there was not bulge bracket at the time. Mm -hmm. It was much more of a boutique middle market investment bank and it was more familial. So they wanted mm -hmm. people to come and stay. They weren't trying to churn and burn. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in my 20s and I was eager yeah. to learn. And I would say for anyone that may be starting in their career, use the time you have in your early career to really work the hours and get the experiences under your belt and develop a really strong foundation because as life goes on, you get less and less time. Yeah. And um, so, so I didn't have to, but yeah, I would take on projects and really try. I mean, I would try to work as long as I could Yeah. and, and I didn't have to, and it sounds insane, mm -hmm. but I'm glad I did because I got experiences that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And I really loved it. And in your twenties, you can still get burnt out, but mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't getting burnt out at all. Now, after about three or four years, I moved over to JP Morgan, which was a mm -hmm. completely different environment. Um, and it was much, you have bigger clients, you're doing mm -hmm. much more product level, um, you're doing less services and more product. And by that, mm -hmm. I mean, like your clients don't necessarily need all the bespoke services that mm -hmm. I was offering at JP at, at RBC. So they were much more had their own teams internally. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were dealing with with companies like Facebook, um, Netflix, mm -hmm. Apple, right? Yeah. Versus like RBC, you're dealing much more with like small IPO clients and you're mm -hmm. really kind of taking them through each step of the way. So like mm -hmm. at JP Morgan, it's much less relationship and much mm -hmm. more process and yeah. product. And so, mm -hmm. um, and the hours there were really insane. Mm -hmm. um, it was much faster paced, much more kind of doggy dog environment. But I mean, I still loved the content yeah. of my work. The environment just changed. Was that um, on the West Coast or was that in New York? In San Francisco, in all San Francisco. in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so after a few years there, um, I was married and my husband and I were commuting between LA mm -hmm. and San Francisco for four or five years. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And so we, he didn't want to move to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to move back to LA. And so our compromise was Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. Wow. That's a different, that's a, it's like, it's like either meet in Cincinnati uh, and we just figure out our base there or um, yeah, I guess what was the driver for Cincinnati? So my husband's job was mm -hmm. in move to Cincinnati. Got it. And, um, you know, we figured it would be for a period of time and mm -hmm. then we would kind of figure out the next steps. And, yeah. um, you know, going there's no investment banking in Cincinnati. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like, well, I'm going to have to take my skill set now mm -hmm. and figure out what to do with it. And I knew I didn't want in my mind. um in the whole financial world, there's templated finance. Mm -hmm. So those are things like commercial banking, um, you know, insurance, underwriting, things where you stick numbers into a template and it spits mm -hmm. an answer out to you, right? Yeah. I didn't want to do anything like that. I didn't want to do wealth management, like none of that. I wanted to do something that was really strategic, something mm -hmm. that would really utilize not that the other ones don't utilize brain power, but really where you're creating novel output. 
Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, there just, there wasn't a lot in Cincinnati. It's completely different than San Francisco. And um, so luckily they were just starting an early stage fund of funds um, that was being backed by some of the largest corporations in Cincinnati, which by the way, includes like Procter and Gamble and mm-hmm. Kroger and Great yeah. American Financial. And so- I think um, PG's headquarters is there. It is. So it's yeah. Kroger. And yeah, so like, I mean, there's a lot for, for the size of Cincinnati, it mm-hmm. hits above its weight class in fortune 500 presence. Yeah. And so they were just starting and I, I was getting paid handsomely at mm-hmm. JP Morgan. Sure. And I was looking for something that would keep me fairly whole, mm-hmm. but I will tell you, I took a 60% pay cut to do something that I thought was interesting versus mm-hmm. being able to stay whole and do something where I was really going to be in a cubicle environment, pushing papers. That's the way mm-hmm. that I thought about it. Yeah. And- no, I resonate with that. I think, you know, if I were to kind of just extract for the audience two life lessons, I think number one, like this is just kind of a relationship, like personal lesson. It's like, look, if you find the right person, like your person and you guys are like both, at the same level of like commitment and you guys are in it for the long haul. Like, you know, I think there's going to be sacrifices that'll be worth it. Right. So those commutes that you guys made between LA and San Francisco, you guys are thinking long-term and there's like so many parallels in life. You, you and I are probably talked about this over cocktails, but like just there's so many parallels with like your person, like your significant other. Um, And some of those resonate with just friendships and like professional relationships too, you know, kind of thinking long-term And then I also have another parallel in my career where I I lived in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That was like, you know, I had an opportunity to take a higher paying job on the West Coast. But like this role was actually like a really good learning experience. um, And it it really helped me get some opportunities in the future. But it wasn't as sexy. The the pay was not that great. But kind of like you, it's like this could probably create um, higher wealth in the future. So exactly. Mm -hmm. And it was such a great in in retrospect. I mean, obviously, Mm -hmm. I didn't know this at the time. I just didn't want to be sitting in a cubicle environment, pushing papers. I wanted to be doing something interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I started with this fund and I was the second employee. We didn't even have DNO insurance. We had nothing. All we had were commitments from these big corporations. We really had to start from scratch. Yeah. And just just. Fast forward back to like the point about comp, I was made whole within three years. I was back to where I was at JP Morgan. It was not that long to get back to whole. And now I'm way beyond that, right? And doing mm-hmm. something really interesting that will hopefully change the world. So um, so we started building that firm and Um, Over a course of time, just really the foundation that investment banking provided and all of those experiences that I took on that I didn't have to really started Mm -hmm. to pay off when we were starting to build something from scratch. Mm -hmm. That's where it's hard, right? That's where you're really trying to pattern match. You're using your experience to figure out what has worked in the past, what hasn't. Like it all starts to create a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And um, so we created that fund and invested on behalf of these large corporations. And in doing that over the course of 10 years, so I was there for Mm -hmm. 10 years, 10 amazing years, um, we started investing in this space that, you know, I believe is the future of venture. Mm -hmm. So within the venture world, there's early stage and late stage in the spectrum. On the early stage side, there is a type of fund where they basically are creating companies internally Mm -hmm. rather than investing in a seed or a series A. And I know we'll get into this, but we started investing in the space at my former firm. And I was like, hey, this is really working. This is really Mm -hmm. interesting. Like the the distribution profiles we're seeing, the alpha we're seeing against our other firms, like I like this. And so over the course of 10 years, I was watching this category grow. I'm like, hey, look, I think it's the right time. And this is the middle of COVID. (laughs) It was Mm -hmm. like, I think it's the right time to really start pursuing this. And there were a lot of other tangential Mm -hmm. factors going on. But now 
we've we've launched our own fund focused exclusively mm -hmm. on that space, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's headquartered in Boulder, Colorado, so we're back out west. And um, yeah, it's it's my baby now. So let's dive a little deeper on the venture studio model. What are the different flavors that you've seen? Because I think there's some in my mind, and I want you to just help me educate the audience. So I feel like there is a structure where um, there is capital used to pay for incubating those companies, it's probably some type of operating budget to build the product, run experiments, and then maybe pay for ads to scale it. So you need capital for that to build those ventures. And then you probably need a second fund or some funding vehicle to complement that to like accelerate them as well. But I'm not sure, um, you know, that's why I want you to, um, to clarify and, and what types of patterns are you seeing with the different types of flavors of Venture Studio? Yeah, so it's, so the Venture Studio world started in the late 90s, call it mm -hmm. with Bill Gross and Idea Lab. He was one of the main OGs that, that launched this mm -hmm. type of business model. And really yeah. it's a business model. Mm -hmm. um, and then over the course of time, as the, the cost of creating new companies decreased, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs had more optionality to create multiple companies at a time with the right teams in place, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you see usually in like around 2010 or so, you see this massive proliferation of company creation funds come online. So between 2010 and 2012, you have a big push. Now it's kind of the floodgates have opened and especially around AI, which is really creating a decline in the cost to build new companies. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of company creation funds come online. But but over time, like it's still, if you think about that 2010 to 2012 period, those entities that got created then are just now getting through a full cycle, mm -hmm. right? And so it's still a very nascent model. Mm -hmm. um, but there are three main structures that we see. One is a holding company type of structure, which I can talk about. One mm -hmm. is like what you were alluding to, um, a fund type structure where they have, you know, basically an entity that does creation work and then they'll do follow on reserves. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a dual entity model, which combines both of those. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think there's pros and cons to all of them. For us, we will only invest in the entity, regardless of what structure it is, mm -hmm. that is doing the creation work that is okay. coming at formation stages. Mm -hmm. And the reason is like we believe in order to have the advantages that this business model provides, you have to have ball control over the build process. That build mm -hmm. process has to become repeatable because that's what drives the efficiencies in this model. You see efficiency mm -hmm. with time and you yeah. see efficiencies with capital inputs, mm -hmm. right? That efficiency is driven by a very repeatable build process. You can only mm -hmm. repeat the build process if you have ball control over development. You only have ball control over development if you are a founder or co-founder. And so that mm -hmm. is our threshold. The entity we're investing into mm -hmm. has to act as a founder or co-founder across their portfolio. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think we should definitely dive a little deeper into the three structures and maybe the pros and cons that you see. So I'm, I'm actually taking notes, too, so I'll share with the community. But so there's the holding company. And then I think the second model was the, just standard the vehicle, fund. the standard fund. Yeah, so it's just a standard fund, but they still need some capital to create those companies, right? So does, I, I guess it's a part, it's an earmark of that standard fund that goes into the operating. Yeah, well, it's so interesting. Okay, so let's take the holding company first. So holding yeah. companies, okay. they'll come out, they'll raise a seed round, mm -hmm. say they'll raise like, I don't know, two on five or mm -hmm. five on 10 or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, they'll come out with a seed round and a general valuation that's market-based. Mm -hmm. And within that seed round, they're using that money they raised to both pay for the team that's doing mm -hmm. the build work and then also 
put the initial capital into those what we call spin outs in this mm -hmm. model. Um, and they'll build anywhere between two, five, usually in a seed round, it'll be like two to five companies. Mm -hmm. then, so it's almost like investing in a portfolio company then, essentially, right? Because you're investing yeah. in a startup and that startup is a startup of startups pretty much, yeah. right? And so like the no holding company. Theory. Right. Yeah. So right. it's a, so you're essentially, yeah. So it's a startup of startups that you're investing in for 5 million. And then, and then they, they do their portfolio construction say, look, you know, just keep the number simple, $5 million venture studio with five companies. And we feel that we can get these companies to what, to their seed round with like a million dollars. Is that kind of like the, the, the pitch or like the roadmap that they have? Yeah. So usually, so there will be some operating costs to mm -hmm. run the whole co yeah. Um, and the, the critical component here, because there's operating costs also in the two and 20 model, the standard fund model. Mm -hmm. um, but those operating costs are value accretive because you're actually paying for the engineers, et cetera, that are building these companies. Right. OK. Um, and so within this landscape, there is mm -hmm. a and, and the most common denominator of success for company creators that really sing they create really strong outcomes mm -hmm. is the process. And okay. so that operating expense, the operating capital is mm -hmm. really to drive the ideation and testing process. Yeah. So they have a whole bunch of ideas, but they have to test those and testing those costs mm -hmm. money, not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the efficiencies, but it costs money. And so mm -hmm. that's your operating expense. Now, once a company, gets through the gauntlet of testing, which is important, mm -hmm. they'll put in a small check, 250 to 500 usually, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what creates the spin out. That's like a green light for spin out. Yeah. And that's when they start really trying to nail the product, the, um, the product market fit, the go to market mm -hmm. strategy, and they'll start trying to bring in management teams usually. Mm -hmm. Now I have to caveat this. There is no standard structure or sure. standard process. Mm -hmm. So all of these company creators bring in management teams at different times in their build work. Mm -hmm. um, but usually that 250 to 500 is the initial check size once it gets through this testing process. And then that goes into kind of building this spin out as a standalone company. Mm -hmm. Some company creation entities will build um, and fund seed. Mm -hmm. Some will build and fund through Series A. Oh, it interesting. Okay. Depends on how much funding they have internally. Mm -hmm. um, the longer they can fund internally, the better off they are. Because once they get into a scale round, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback in this model. And we can talk a little bit about this. But there's a lot of pushback in this model on ownership and the allocations of ownership and equity mm -hmm. between the company creators and the ultimate management company. Um, and so the longer they can fund internally, the less mm -hmm. there is from external market forces. They also see if they can do that, they can also skip like maybe one to two rounds of dilution as well, right? If they kind of skip all the way to series A. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So like if, I, if I'm doing the hold code structure, $5 million in a startup of startups, um, how much, yeah, how much ownership can I get into the holding company um, typically? So, okay, so this is a good question. And let me make sure I explain it. Because I think of it almost like investing in a startup, right? So if you invest in a startup, like in the venture stage, you know, there's a percentage of ownership that VCs are expecting, right, when they're investing in a startup. So is it kind yeah. of the same methodology with this? There's a lot of layers of ownership. So first, okay. with a holding company structure, mm -hmm. the capital owns mm -hmm. a certain percentage of Holdco. Got it. Okay. Right. So, so when they're raising that five million, they're selling a piece of Holdco, <laughs> and generally that will be anywhere. We like to see it at least thirty percent, especially if it's a seed round. Um, yeah. There's so much risk involved in mm -hmm. returning capital, but sure. it can be anywhere from twenty to forty percent generally mm -hmm. that they're selling at any particular round. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now, when they go in to build. Mm -hmm. They typically will own a company outright 100% until they get a management team in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one of the interests. So we don't see that in a standard fund. The, the ownership levels tend to be different. But in a hold code, the ownership tends to be 
a bit higher. Now, once mm -hmm. they bring in a management team, typically we'll see hold co's. There's a co-founding model with hold co's. Mm -hmm. So that's where they own 50% and the management team owns 50% and they're co-founders. Mm -hmm. They get diluted uh, very past due, right? Mm -hmm. As they go through fundraising. So do you get any, so like, because you're an LP in the hold co, do you get any exposure or like additional shares in the the, co the company that was created now that it has a management team? So with structure, my, my answer is always going to be sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends. It, well, and, and it like all structures are so different. Yeah. Uh -huh. The typical structure and, and we've talked to over 200. Mm -hmm. I will tell you when I say typical, maybe like two of those 200 are the mm -hmm. same. And, and yeah. so, um, most often, if you're if the hold co is raising a seed round, mm -hmm. yeah. and let's say we as capital own forty percent of hold co, mm -hmm. um, then hold co will own. Let's call it. Let's say it's a found a co founding model. Mm -hmm. They'll own fifty percent of port co, right? Okay. Yeah. And so by default, then we own twenty percent of port co on a pass through basis. Got it. Now that gets diluted over time, but mm -hmm. that's very good ownership from an LP's perspective, right? And then the, the parallel is almost kind of like, hey, you know, do you want to co-invest? So if, you know, if there is an allocation within that portfolio company, you can re, you know, you can additionally invest if, if they allow you to, right? Well, kind of like a co-investing relationship so as an cool, LP. The cool part about this business model is mm -hmm. remember they have, they, they are advantaged mm -hmm. in keeping their companies internal as yeah. long as possible, right? Got it. Mm -hmm. And so the co-invest opportunities always flow through to the LP family before mm -hmm. going to external market. Yeah. And I say always, I sure. shouldn't use, I shouldn't use superlatives, but um, yeah. most of the time we will see the co-invest before it goes to external market. Yeah. There's a lot of co-invest. And one of the things about co-invest in this model is it's highly vetted and tested mm -hmm. so yeah. there are a lot of key differences that early process of testing and killing mm -hmm. are so important it is what differentiates this model from mm -hmm. traditional venture where you have one founder one idea and they're mm -hmm. paired and they they will pivot yeah. but those pivots are expensive mm -hmm. and they don't in this model they pivot on day zero and day one right they're not mm -hmm. pivoting on day 12. And so really when they're testing some of these ideas, mm -hmm. they'll generally test five or six at a time. They're yeah. not just testing one, but they may say, hey, this is a pain point over here we need to solve. Mm -hmm. We can solve it in five or six different ways. Which one do we see the strongest demand for and the strongest mm -hmm. unit economics, the best sales cycle, all of that stuff. So they're trying to kill off everything mm -hmm. and the strongest survive. So when we look at co-invest in this category, it tends to be much stronger, much more sustainable because it mm -hmm. went through that early testing and killing cycle. Let's talk about the testing. So what, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking there's probably surveys or some small spend on Facebook ads to see if people click on stuff, but we'd like <laughs> you to correct me on the proper ads, way to no. do it. Um, we don't like Facebook ads. We oh, do you don't? Get okay. We do see it sometimes, but yeah. we just don't, it's not, it, it's not a proof point in our minds that okay. there's going to be a viable, sustainable product. Mm -hmm. We also don't do a lot in the consumer space. Um, okay. We tend to, it's, consumers are very fickle mm -hmm. in their spending behavior. And, yeah. you know, like we're seeing in this market cycle, mm -hmm. discretionary spend, it will go out the door very quickly. Yeah. Um, we do like non-discretionary spend products. So um, mm -hmm. things like housing, um, education, mm -hmm. cars, healthcare, mm -hmm. food, things like that. Um, but discretionary spend products we're not we're not fans of. So, so I mean, most of the companies are mostly B2B SaaS companies. B2B SaaS yeah. or B2C in a non-discretionary mm -hmm. category. Um, and okay. and usually when it's B2C, it's B2B to C. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so yeah, can you break that down? So, so non-discretionary meaning it's uh, yeah. Can you just explain that a little bit? Essentials. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, 
yeah, so so essential items. We're not mm-hmm. looking at things that consumers don't necessarily need. The mm-hmm. nice to haves is not yeah. where we're investing. We Got want it. to invest in the need to haves. Mm-hmm. So w- we have some really strong companies in, mm-hmm. for instance, like rental housing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, people, people that are renting, the demographic that rents, mm-hmm. their housing is one of their biggest spend items. Yeah. And it is an essential. And mm-hmm. so making their lives easier, better, more convenient, or cheaper mm-hmm. through their housing um, is something that will constantly be in demand in good markets and bad. And honestly, yeah. it's recessionary advantage. Mm-hmm. In recessionary markets, it's even stronger because there are yeah. more renters. So it's things like that. And I would say mm-hmm. also in that category, you have healthcare, which is mm-hmm. a huge expense for consumers yeah. um, and anything to make healthcare more transparent, more convenient, mm-hmm. more affordable, um, food, you know, things that like the things that will are- never go out of style. Like you will always have to pay your taxes. You will yeah. always have a finite life. So you need healthcare. And then to your point, you know, it's never going to go out of style that you have to live somewhere. Right. So. Right. Um, but, but it is discretionary to go on vacation for instance, yeah. or it is discretionary to buy an expensive hand cream. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, so things that you don't have to buy when yeah. things are tough are not things mm-hmm. we're investing in. Now sure. we'll also invest. We've seen a lot in the B2B space. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we should talk a little bit about AI too, but mm-hmm. um you know, having worked with corporations for 10 years at our former firm, we know the sell cycles going into corporations. We know the pain points, we know the contract values Mm -hmm. um, and how much they spend on software. So there are certain categories within that B2B space Mm -hmm. that are incredibly interesting. um, And we've seen a lot there too. So, and also biotech. So Moderna was created in this exact business model by flagship. They are a company creator. That's all they do mm-hmm. on the therapeutic side. Um, and drug drug discovery and drug development is mm-hmm. an area that we're investing in. So, you know, and you mentioned the testing and I know you um, you don't like, uh, you know, running running ads, especially on Facebook. So what, what has worked to help these founders get very quick um, validation of their ideas? Is it like surveys, customer work groups? Um, yeah, so a lot in the, so in the B2B space, especially, mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of strategic partnerships that help yeah. with that early testing, mm-hmm. um, demand sensing, and really looking at unit economics to make sure yeah. everything makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are strategic partnerships that go a long way. There yeah. is a co there are a lot of cohort based models. In mm-hmm. fact, Talking about AI right now, there is a um, there's capability where AI there can be AI generated mm-hmm. consumer profiles. Okay. Right? And so, if you're creating a new consumer capability, let's say mm-hmm. a new sense or um, a new you know fintech capability that you're going to mm-hmm. sell directly to consumers, you can actually create subscribers mm-hmm. and do your initial beta run on those subscribers to get feedback and test. And um, so there's a lot. The only reason I say I don't like Facebook ads Mm -hmm. is because it's not an intent to buy. Yeah. Right. And and so Mm -hmm. a lot of times, like I said, consumers are really fickle. You're only getting Mm -hmm. consumers on Facebook. Right. Yeah. They may say, oh, this is interesting. I want to click on it. That's not Mm -hmm. an intent to buy. Now, what we have seen is like it will click through to websites and then the Mm -hmm. website you actually take in credit card information. That's an intent to buy. Sure. But it's just it's a if you're building a company and I know this has happened to some very large companies that have come out of the company creation fund space. Uh huh. But if you're building a company that's exclusively based on your ability to acquire customers based on Facebook ads, mm-hmm. it's not sustainable. Yeah, right? sure. Well, I think, yeah, you know, I think a lot of these two, over time, they have to kind of think about an omni-channel approach because Facebook could shut down your account. Um, so, you know, having some tentacles into, you know, just really organic content and uh, really great audiences. I actually saw this post just like two hours ago about, you know, Kim Kardashian's private equity fund. And, you know, the fact that she has a huge organic reach, um, that also definitely helps. Because imagine if you had, 
you know, a portion of those people were, you know, obviously accredited or large qualified purchasers. Just the fact that you have that distribution is something that like even like a car log group might not even have, you know, because they obviously they can they can make a few phone calls and get some large, you know, billion dollar checks from some uh, conglomerates. But I think sometimes that distribution um, definitely helps with just kind of building your your brand. Um, which I thought, so I'm going to read the rest of that article, but it was pretty interesting. She kind of, I think she spoke at super return. So there was kind of like an overview on that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was really helpful. I think that's a really, um, you know, good detailed overview on the holding company. And then if you could touch on the standard fund, maybe some pros and cons or things we didn't know about. And then also the dual entity model, um, that would be great too. Yeah. So um, the standard fund, you have a two and 20, which 2% management fee, 20% yeah. carry. And I would say this model investors are really used to looking at because it mm -hmm. follows traditional venture structures. Um, and the 2% management fee, like I said earlier, is value accretive. Not all of it, but a big portion of it is going to pay. And so the, a big portion of it is going to pay the, te the tech team or the talent team, if it's in biotherapeutics, mm -hmm. to build these companies. Now, what mm -hmm. this means okay. is your management fee has to cover your operating expenses. Yeah, it needs to be, I mean, the fund needs to be big enough because you're not hiring analysts, right? You're hiring an engineer. You might need a front-end engineer, a back-end engineer. So yeah. does this really only make sense if it's like a bigger fund? Because you just exactly. need a bigger budget for personnel. It would much more complex and like much more... I would say expensive than like the typical venture employees. I would, I would think, yeah. right. You really only see the two and 20 model at sizes above a hundred million yeah. because that 2% has to pay for the team, Got it. which is why we see um, a lot more dual entity structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But because some of these engineers, especially if you're thinking about like, you know, if you're not building on top of chat GPT and you're built, you're hiring like an AI ML engineer, like some of those engineers get paid like, you know, 600 700k at google so you'd have to maybe sell them to come on that mission and kind of like how you and i did in our early careers like hey build something bigger right and like join this venture studio model um because we probably couldn't even even at the 100 million dollar fund i don't think you can get like the top tier tech talent just because of the numbers of like the salary of like those engineers right 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 yeah. and so on the dual entity model mm -hmm these company creators are able to raise a portion of capital that goes into mm -hmm. their holding code that pays for their operating expenses. Yeah. And so they are able to raise, let's call it 5 million into hold co mm -hmm. that pays for the tech talent and it pays for the build talent that they yeah. need over a period of time to build mm -hmm. the spin outs. And then once they get to a point of spin out, they have a fund, a standard two and 20 fund that yeah. then comes in and invest in those spin outs for reserve capital. It's the most flexible model because it allows it investors is. to, it allows investors to either invest in a hold co if that's mm -hmm. what they prefer or invest in a standard fund. And it also allows the management team, the, the partners of the studio to have enough capital to run their studio and yeah. also have reserves without having to raise a hundred million dollar fund. Mm -hmm. So we do see this entity a lot, and I do think it has a lot of flexibilities. Mm -hmm. and it gets a little bit challenging, and our I, I don't I, there's probably not any company creation people watching, but <laughs> our preference always is just to keep it simple. When we mm -hmm. go into some of these conversations, and the structure is like multiple share classes and multiple entities funding at the same time, and we're just like, no, we're not even going to parse through it. It's not worth our yeah. time. It's too complicated. So mm -hmm. it needs to stay simple and it just needs to be fair across the board because a good, outcome a, is a good outcome. Yeah. I got a fourth one, um, a fourth model that you've probably seen and, you know, shoot me down with this one if you've probably seen, but like, what about like these dev shops that also do agency work? Um, I've seen an interesting model recently where there's agencies that will, you know, manage clients. And, you know, you're going to hate that I'm saying this, but like they, they run Instagram, Facebook, TikTok has, and they grow, um, you know, their clients business and help these, you know, customers actually grow to revenue. And then what they do is they'll take some equity in the company 
Um, so, you know, that structure is pretty interesting because they're doing operational work and actually augmenting the team of these portfolio companies. And then they get some um, they get some equity and then they also get revenue from, you know, probably extra projects that they do to kind of support those companies. Um, so I've seen that a few times. I don't know if you've ever had like any dev shops try to like approach you and say, look, um, you know, we build all these ventures with people. We get revenue because people want us to build ventures for them. Um, but like we also and then that also helps us have some money to kind of build our own ventures, too. So I don't know, like if you've seen other kind of models that didn't work um, and, and maybe why you, you know, said no to those models. Yeah. I mean, we do see a ton of different models, mm -hmm. but yeah. again, like our threshold is the mm -hmm. entity we're investing into has to act as a founder or co-founder. So it. just equity for services. Mm -hmm. We see mm -hmm. that a lot. And the term venture studio, the reason we stopped using it, mm -hmm. it is a sexy term and it's yeah. used by everybody, regardless mm -hmm. of whether they're actually creating these companies or not. Yeah. So we really think about the entities we're investing into mm -hmm. have to act as a founder or co-founder. We've Got seen it. agencies and we've seen, you know, we've seen agencies call themselves venture studios, but mm -hmm. honestly, yeah, it's a fee for services model, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Maybe yeah. there's a few that are mm -hmm. actually like really going all in, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's not it's not in our investing universe. Yeah. The problem is too, I think what you're alluding to is, you know, you kind of dilute the quality because if you're doing fee for service, you might just service anyone that just pays you the fee, even if they're not really a great company, it may not be a company that actually could be venture backable, but it could just be a client. That's like, look, you know what, can you, can you get me to, you know, a hundred to 200 K a month, but it's not a venture type of business. It could be some type of e-commerce brand. Um, but like when you're all in, you know, as a hold co, you, you actually have, you have to, you know, there's this pressure for you to build those companies and, and make them successful, which I think is what you're saying. Yeah, and the and ball then... control is the most important component here. Mm -hmm. If you okay. don't have ball control, you lose the efficiencies. And it's not to say there's not going to be good outcomes, mm -hmm. but you lose the advantage of this business model, which is the efficiencies that a repeatable build process drives. So when you say ball control, is that control for the, yeah, can you, can you unpack that? So is that just control of ownership, like having majority ownership or? No, you don't even have to have control. You don't even have to have majority ownership, yeah. but you need to be able to, di I'm going to say influence, dictate. influence a developer. Roadmap. You need to be able to identify the talent that's going to come in to operate the companies. You Got need it. to be able to pull the trigger Mm -hmm. on you know what milestones you need to see before capital gets deployed you need to be able to run these companies and these mm -hmm. ideas through a dedicated playbook that mm -hmm. has been proven so we think it takes at least five builds to get to a state where these company creators can become efficient because uh, you start to understand mm -hmm. what milestones are meaningful right yeah. what patterns do you need to see before mm -hmm. you back the truck up and really put capital to work. Like the loss ratios we see in this category, and this is driven by process and ball control. Mm -hmm. The loss ratios we see in this cat this category on capital are single digits. Wow. Because they are doing this rigorous testing and killing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have ball control, you don't get to control whether an idea is killed. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, that so makes sense. It's these critical components where it's and, and you we've seen company creation funds and hold co's that have teens ownership that are crushing it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's not the ownership percentage that matters mm -hmm. as much as being able to put them through an efficient process. Yeah. Where you have control over those milestones. Sure. And then what are some of the if you were to kind of walk through the dream state playbook, like, hey, this company, this is the company that really nailed the formula. What are some of the milestones that you would see? I mean, in my mind, I would think, hey, you did some testing, you got a prototype, and then maybe there's some initial revenue. But I want you to fill in the blanks for me in terms of what's the ideal dream state milestones that you see as the checklist. So typically the process um, of ideation and testing mm -hmm takes a few weeks, call it three to six weeks. Mm -hmm. We have a pain point. So it always needs to start with what is the problem you're solving, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't create a lot of hammers looking for nails, but what is the problem you're solving? And then what is the universe of possibilities to solve that problem? Mm -hmm. 
three to six weeks of testing, mm -hmm. identifying what the most likely, what the most likely leader is, if any. So oftentimes mm -hmm. at this point, we may see the entity going back to the drawing board. But will that and will that solution work? Will it solve this pain point? Are we getting indicators of latent demand? Are unit economics working out? Things like that. So let's just say all of that is a yes, right? At mm -hmm. that point, they'll say, okay, we need to put some money in. Now, some company creators will put in a tiny amount, let's call it 50,000 and keep mm -hmm. building. Some at that point will put in like 250 to 500, that initial check, and then they'll go mm -hmm. and, and really kind of create that seed environment. At that point, they're starting to look for, if it's not the co-founding model, so the co-founding model, they'll day zero, when they're testing and ideating, they have a founder in the door. Mm -hmm. If it's not a co-founding model, they'll start building that management team generally around this time. So within six weeks, you should be able to identify that a company ha has viability or mm -hmm. not, right? Got it. Yeah. And our preference, candidly, our preference is not. Mm -hmm. We want to see that the team can kill fast without money. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so and then you go through build the management team and you're going through the initial beta process, right? Mm -hmm. And again, this is like another six week increment. So you're going through the initial beta, trying to build and get your initial customers to test mm -hmm. and drive pilots. So generally within like a three to six month period, mm -hmm. you are through your seed and you're moving towards your A with full time management team and external capital. And what type of revenue with this kind of model, you know, let's say six months end to end, um, getting into seed, what types of like monthly recurring revenue are you guys seeing on average? And I know it varies based, based on the business type. Wildly. Like, yes. So yeah. one of the things with like B2C versus B2B mm -hmm. versus B2B2C, um, yeah. the B2B sales cycle is much longer mm -hmm. and it often depends on how embedded that software system may be in mm -hmm. a given organization. Yeah. BC tends to be much faster, mm -hmm. um, but again, like a little bit more finicky. So mm -hmm. it, it varies widely. Um, in fact, some, and it depends on the strategy of the company creation entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some are doing very high, we've seen some that are doing very high volume build work. And mm -hmm. so they may be building like 10 companies a month. And in that yeah. case, you know, maybe they want to get to a million in ARR per company mm -hmm. um, and then start like piecing them out, selling them off. Mm -hmm. Some that are building for like private equity acquisition. So they're trying to get to profitability faster. So a yeah. lot of it depends on the strategy of the entity. Mm -hmm. um, and in that guise, because they're all different, we really are looking at like, what is the GP to strategy mm -hmm. fit? Right? Yeah. They're building in the right category and are they building for the right strategy based on their experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if you have that, I mean, I think that that's also really strategic if you build that strategy out within your six week kind of post testing phase where you're like, look, we're going to we're going to achieve a private equity model. We're going to get to, you know, three to three to 15 million in EBITDA in this period of time. And like if you already have those relationships with those um, PE investors, you know, those people are sourcing deals and they're looking for companies, yeah. target companies that fit within those parameters. So if you already kind of have that right. exit scenario already mapped out, that also makes it like a repeatable machine too. Um, Cause you're getting them to liquidity much faster. So that's um, that seems like a really attractive model. And then the L and then let's take, you know, I know we got like, you know, six, seven minutes left the LP portfolio construction strategy. Right. So like um, you know, if an LP maybe has like a 50, to hundred million dollar fund, I guess what what should there be? What should their portfolio construction uh, look like? I guess there and, and I guess should they have some reserve for follow on as well to follow on and re up these funds? Oh, for an investor into these yeah. company creation funds? Yeah, yeah. Like so now, just one level above, like with the LP standpoint, any just kind of wisdom you have uh, for them as they're as they're evaluating these company creation funds. Well, so this category is incredibly decentralized and there's mm -hmm. a very long and noisy tail of company yeah. creators. And mm -hmm. like you and I just talked about, there's a million structures, strategies. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very hard category to do. Yeah. Independently. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We spend our full time looking at this category because we believe the alpha it provides is well worth the effort. But we don't do buyouts, growth, Mm -hmm. publics. Most LPs do. Yeah. And so I think if you have a diversified portfolio strategy where you're doing Mm -hmm. more than just company creation investing, it makes a ton of sense to work with somebody that is more of a specialist if this Mm -hmm. is an area where you want exposure. And honestly, for any LP that has early stage venture exposure, Mm -hmm. this company creation business model should be in that segment of the portfolio. The alpha it produces is just Mm -hmm. high shoulders above what you would see from traditional venture. So um, I don't want to shout out to vault fund, but like I would definitely try to look at a, some type of advisor or specialist Mm -hmm. to help you through this category because it is the wild west. Mm -hmm. And while the upside is very high, there is an equally large downside. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Yeah. Cause I think it's to your point, right? I think the benefit of Partnering with experts is kind of helping to navigate um, this this ecosystem. Um, And and I think for me, it was really helpful to understand the hold code structure. So the and then what's the actual entity? Is it usually like an LLC that has underlying uh, like multi-series LLCs under the hold co or what what kind of structure do they, you know, as far as the company entity, what what is preferred? Is it like a Delaware LLC or? Wyoming. Um, yeah, we're <laughs> oh no. Um, we are only investing domestically. So all of ours right now are Delaware. Okay. Um, or you know, I would say all of them are Delaware. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of of the five we've invested in to mm-hmm. our hold co's out of okay. the five. Yeah. And um, they're Delaware. So mm-hmm. and I would say the the structure really varies. I mean, I mm-hmm. think um you want it to be tax advantage. There's no Mm -hmm. carry involved in a hold co, Mm -hmm. but you do have very fast value accretion Mm -hmm. um, because you don't have that J curve effect. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, you want a tax advantage, something where the pass through Mm -hmm. tax liability is going to be funded until the Mm -hmm. distributions are returned. Well, and then I guess usually in the typical venture structure, you rely on secondaries to be able to deliver some liquidity. But in this model, the hold co structure, there could be maybe a fast private equity exit that could probably deliver some uh, returns faster as well. Right. If there's kind of like a, a quick strategic buyout because one of those companies like it, you know, gets swallowed up by a conglomerate that could could that be kind of like an analogy to like maybe secondaries as far as just delivering some liquidity if some of those companies move fast and and become successful. You yeah, and you see, your LPs. you see secondaries in the hold co model too from your portfolio. Yeah. Um, okay. I would say the biggest difference in the hold co model is you have to have an understanding on distributions before mm-hmm. investing in a hold co. Otherwise, you can you can probably promise that distributions would be recycled mm-hmm. indefinitely um, unless it's not an evergreen hold co. So there, that just has to come through up front. But yeah, we have there are secondaries in this in this category a lot, actually, because yeah. the we're investing in are mm-hmm. founders and co-founders. So there's no signaling risk if they're mm-hmm. selling founders level equity. And candidly, they're coming in at such low valuations. By the time mm-hmm. a company gets north of 100 million in value, you can guarantee you probably have a 10 multiple. So selling yeah. selling um, partial stakes in secondary mm-hmm. is um is fairly common. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, we flew through this hour. I feel like this was an amazing masterclass. Um, and I took a lot of notes, so I'll share this with the um, the post. But Sarah, I really appreciate you unpacking all this. I mean, I know I learned a lot. So um, really good catching up with you and see you soon. Hopefully, if you make it out here, if I make it out over there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch, they can either reach out on LinkedIn or um, feel free to send my email. All right. Great. See you, Sarah. Take Take care. care. Bye. Bye.